Welcome everyone uh, to the mining seminar series. My name is Joseph Troba. Um, I'm one of the committee members. Uh, we try to invite uh, relevant industry professionals to talk on a bunch of different mining related topics. Uh, today we have Nolan Sellis. Uh, he'll be talking about geotechnical instrumentation and data collection for monitoring mining applications. Uh, Nolan is the regional sales engineer for the Western United States for Geocon, a geotechnical and structural instrumentation manufacturer located in Lebanon, New Hampshire. He has over 10 years experience as a consulting geologist and over two years of experience as a technical sales engineer at Geocon. Um, once again, as a reminder, we are on Zoom, so everyone please keep your mics muted online. Um, with that, I would love to hand it off to Nolan. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name's Nolan. Thank you for coming today. Appreciate it. We have a good presentation here for you. So uh, to get started, this will be a geotechnical instrumentation and data collection for monitoring mining applications. Uh, the focus on, on vibrating wire technology, which is what Geocon, uh, the company that I work for, specializes in. And again, a little bit myself, I'm a, I'm a Western rep for Geocon. I'm in sales, I uh, have a background in geology. Went to, went to school for earlier here in uh, Boulder, so I'm happy back in Colorado. It's a great state. Um, and yeah, basically, I do a lot of mining in, in Southwest uh, United States, kind of west of Colorado, a little bit of Mexico, and a little bit of Canada. So a little bit about Geocon, just a quick overview on, on who we are and what we do. Uh, we were founded in 1979 and we're located in Lebanon, New Hampshire. We operate on a worldwide basis through a network of regional offices and agencies. The company currently has over 120 employees. Uh, we basically our broad range of geotechnical instrumentation is designed and manufactured at our factory by staff of qualified experienced engineers, machinists, and assemblers. Uh, Geocon, through innovation and experience, has developed a line of vibrating wire sensors and surpassing more in the world. So these highly reliable devices have contributed in no small way to, to help and grow uh, worldwide acceptance of every wire as being the most suitable technology for uh, geotechnical applications and measurements. And we'll go into why that is, uh, kind of what vibrating wire instruments are, the theory behind it, uh, and the, the little instruments that, that uh, come with that. So just a quick introduction on the uh, Seminar today, we'll go into some reasons for monitoring. Why do we monitor? Uh, some important geotechnical measurements. What are we measuring? How are we measuring those? Uh, the geotechnical instrumentation that performs those types of measurements. Then we'll go into how the data is collected, data collection options, um, kind of how to get all your data together, what's out there in the world, and then the big picture, hopefully tying all of that together. So some reasons for monitoring, and these are from Alan Marr. Alan Marr founded uh, the Geocomp Corporation, a pretty well-known uh, guy in the industry. So uh, just to run through a few of these, you know, en enable the use of, of the observational method, indicate impending failure, which is a huge one for mining, uh, making sure things are safe, reveal unknowns, <clears throat> minimize damage to adjacent structures, relies remedial measures to fix problems, uh, improving performance, again, a big one in mining, make sure everything's efficient and make sure everything runs smoothly. Advance your state of knowledge, understanding what's in front of you, what you're, what you're mining, what you're trying to accomplish. Forming stakeholders and satisfying regulators. <clears throat> so to get into vibrating wire theory, um, how these instruments work, kind of the internals of them, um, think of it like a musical instrument. So I put this guitar player up here on this slide. Uh, you can kind of think of it like a guitar wire or a piano wire, uh, basically strung between two fixed points. So in this diagram on the left here, uh, we have a vibrating wire, typically a steel wire, um, in tension between two fixed points. On top of that, you have a plucking coil and permanent magnet assembly. And basically, um, depending on the instrument, as pressure is applied to that instrument or strain or any of the various parameters, it's gonna change the frequency of that wire. As that wire elongates or shortens, um, it's basically plucked, sends the frequency back to a data logger or a handheld readout. And those can be basically uh, converted into engineering units based on uh, the calibration information we obtain from the lab when these are made. So as the wire tension changes, so it's natural frequency. Some attributes of vibrating wires, uh, why they're so great, 
and why they're so um, you know well found here in the industry. Uh, they're very robust and durable. They're very stable long term. Uh, very little drift. They they can be permanently installed and be a reliable instrument for for decades in some cases. Uh, the frequency output can be transmitted in very long signal lengths. Cables can be easily spliced, cut back, added onto. Signals not influenced by water or moisture. Uh, the instruments themselves cannot have water or moisture in them, but the, the cable itself can with uh, no degradations. They can be very easily data logged, and the cost benefit is, is very great. So they're, they're a relatively inexpensive item, and they uh, provide just great data for uh, mining applications, <laughs> engineering applications. This is a, a table from our laboratory. So we've been around for 40 plus years. Uh, these are our model 4500, which is a piezometer, so pressure transducer. And these have been under laboratory conditions for about 40 years. Uh, this, this graph goes back to 1983. We take periodic measurements on these instruments, um, usually annually. This is an annual chart. Um, as you can see from then till, till present, actually just got this yesterday with our new, our new measurements on these um, transducers. And, for this 40, about 40 year time period, you can see very little drift for that time period. Kind of shows you the reliability of these instruments over time. <clears throat> so, some factors affecting vibrating wire instruments um, they're not as well suited for dynamic applications, and that being faster than like a second. So, 1000 hertz measurements, 100 hertz measurements. Um, that is somewhat in the past, new technologies have made that more possible. Companies like Campbell Scientific, some of the big data logging companies have new technology that allows you to take measurements on that frequency. Um, they can be managed by electrical surgeons such as lightning, uh, but they're less susceptible than other types of, types of electrical transducers. Uh, nowadays, we build in surge arresters into the instrument itself, and typically people will add lightning protection to the instruments, um, which mitigates this issue. And then readings can be influenced by electrical interference, such as uh, pump, uh, pump motors, power lines, things like that. So we can do things like uh, shield the instrument. You can shield it magnetically in a metal pipe and things. You can shield the cable itself. There's ways to get around this issue. Um, and now we have new technology uh, called spectral analysis, which can actually take the noise out of the, the vibrating wire signal. You can really dial into what it's actually measuring and filter out that noise from electrical interference or a variety of other um, interferences that sometimes occur. So now we'll get into some important geotechnical measurements. So what are we measuring? What instruments are we using to measure these parameters? Um, on the left-hand column, you can see a, a various measure amps. On the right, you can see the instruments that perform these measurements. So for displacement or deformation, we can use crack meters, exensometers, tilt meters and inclinometers, settlement systems, uh, for load structural members, uh, load cells and strain gauges. For water pressure, we use piezometers. Total stress in soil or rock, we use uh, pressure cells. Stress change in rock, borehole pressure cells, and stress meters. And then temperature measurements, a uh, variety of temperature sensors, such as thermistors and things like that. Um, we can also do vibration measurements. I'm not going to go into that too much today, but it does exist out there. Um, those are used quite often in mining during blasting. And, and uh, stability and things like that. So now we'll get into um, specifically some of these instruments, how they're how they're built, how they perform, uh, what you may use them for, certain applications and things. So to start, we'll get into pore water pressure and water level measurements. Um, these are often used in, in mining dewatering programs, tailing dams, slope stability studies, institute mining practices on beach pads, and for remediation and environmental purposes. I'm sure there's a, a few things I missed here too, but just to name a few. Um, so, piezometers, some applications for piezometers. Um, they basically obtain groundwater elevation and pore pressure measurements. Uh, they're often installed inside boreholes, observation wells, and standard piezometer riser pipe. <clears throat> they can be used during pump tests, measuring uplift pressures in dam foundations, hydraulic pressures in tanks and pipelines, wick drain efficiency measurements. Uh, water pressure behind tunnel lines for underground applications, uh, reservoir and lake levels, as, as well as weir levels, and slope stability studies. So there's a there's a, a variety of different piezometer types and technology that uh, can be considered. 
use in a presometer. We're going to touch today on vibrating wire, but just so you know, there's other technologies that exist. Um, open standby, like an open monitoring well, basically, where you're manually measuring. Um, twin tube hydraulic, strain gauge type, where they have a data logger or a battery kind of built into the instrument itself. Uh, fiber optic and flushable pieces. So getting into vibrating wire pisometers, um, these are kind of our bread and butter here at Geocon. Uh, probably sell more of these than, than anything else. Um, they're used in many different industries, but especially in mining, except it's a, probably one of the most common instruments we see. Uh, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, depending on your particular application. Uh, just to get into, again, the vibrating wire portion of it, <clears throat> in this middle diagram is kind of a cutaway view of one of these pieces. So think of it like this top left picture of a cutaway. So this is the filter tip here. That's what's going to be in contact with the, uh, the formation where the pressure is basically pushing on the instrument. So inside you have this little vibrating wire with your magnetic assembly around it. As the pressure from that formation or um, water body is pushing on that diaphragm, <coughs> it's going to shorten and elongate that vibrating wire based on the pressure it's feeling. So where it's installed, how that, how that water level or pressure is fluctuating, uh, that can be recorded with this instrument. And again, so it's basically plucked with that magnetic um, plucking coil and that frequency sent back to a data logger, which can then be converted to a uh, pressure measurement or a water level measurement with calibration. Uh, back. So these do come in a variety of different sizes and shapes. Uh, for example, this top one is a, is a standard piezometer you know, for basically uh, simple grout in applications, a couple hundred feet. Uh, this bottom one is a drive point piezometer. So these can be installed with CPT rigs. They can actually be hand drilled, or, uh, hand driven down into a hole, uh, usually for, for soft soils and clays. Um, top right here is a heavy duty type piezometer. Uh, these exist for, you know, very high pressure applications, uh, you know, 20 MPA, very high pressure applications. Um, often in tailings dams where you may have some movement, uh, you know, some shearing, it just gives a little more support to the instrument itself. And then the bottom right here is a, <clears throat> a geo uh, high temp piezometer for geothermal applications. Uh, they can be used up to like 250 degrees C, you know, very hot applications. So um, they also come in, in corrosion resistance types so you can manufacture these and other, other companies can manufacture these with uh, titanium or Inconel, which is a nickel chromium alloy, uh, often used in, in very corrosive environments. It handles a, a low or very high pH for long. Well. In addition to that, you want to take uh, cable types into consideration. So these come with a variety of different signal cables, uh, PVC, polyurethane, uh, stainless steel. We have heavy duty armor cables for uh, high shearing environments and uh, near blasting. So uh, there's a lot of different things that go into picking these instruments and a lot of different options that exist out there. So some advantages of using vibrating wire pisometers, they're very easy to read. They have a very short time lag, so you're getting uh, you know, efficient data quickly. They can read negative pore pressures. Cut off there, sorry. So they can typically read up to negative 15 PSI pore pressure. Uh, and then some limitations, it takes careful manufacturing techniques to, to uh, minimize that zero drift over time. Um, those are very important. So we pride ourselves on, so if there are companies around the world pride themselves on, is manufacturing these vibrating wires to the correct specifications so you get good longevity out of your instruments over time. And obviously the correct, uh, you know, accurate measurements. And then there is a need for lightning protection in, in some applications. As you mentioned, there's a built-in arrestor in, in all these instruments. So then we'll get into a weir monitor briefly. <clears throat> this is also a vibrating wire instrument. Um, the vibrating wire transducer itself hangs at the top of the stilling wall. Um, these are very accurate instruments. They're used to measure, you know, a water level very accurately, less than a millimeter typically accuracy. Um, in weirs, you know, shallow streams, shallow <coughs> reservoirs even, typically six feet and under basically. Um, so how these work is they have a, a weight that hangs on this vibrating wire transducer at the top of the stilling well. Stilling wells uh, installed inside of the weir or inside the reservoir or stream. And as that water level changes, uh, the buoyancy on that weight changes. So which in turn uh, changes the tension on that vibrating wire. You get a very accurate water level measurement. So now we get into uh, slope stability and lateral drift movements. 
Uh, this is often measured in tailings dams, waste piles, and open pit line walls, as you can see in this picture here. Kind of the, the reason we monitor to mitigate things like this happening, or at least we can uh, try to predict things like this happening. So we'll get into equinometers first. Um, equinometers are a, a very common um, sensor used in, in the field. Uh, some applications are measuring lateral, lateral deformation in dams and tailings, monitoring the stability of natural slopes, grand slides and embankments, lateral movements in, around, and above tunnels and underground openings, <coughs> and monitoring waste rock stability, as well as a plethora of other applications in uh, some of civil engineering projects. So the most basic form of an inclinometer is going to be a survey or a manual type inclinometer. So the way these work is you basically install a uh, grip casing, which we call an inclinometer casing, into your area of concern, into your slope, into your wall, uh, where you're trying to measure lateral deformation. Uh, inside of there, there's basically a, a groove at the uh, north, south, east, and west axes of that casing. And a probe is basically set down on those tracks to the very bottom of the casing, pulled up every half meter, every two feet, depending on where you are in the world. <clears throat> and a measurement is taken uh, on tilt angle on each one of those locations. Uh, using that tilt angle, you can basically determine your deflection across that whole pipe protocol. So um, they're very good for measuring, you know, uh, layers you think may be unstable. You can determine where that might be shearing and by how much. This is uh, just a couple of pictures of what these look like. Top left here is going to be your manual inclinometer probe, and then it comes with a reel. It's marked every every two feet or every half meter, so you can, uh, as you reel it up in the casing, you can basically set it and take your measurement with a little handheld readout here, usually a field computer, and it uh, logs all your data as you're pulling. So this is oriented typically for manual surveys. It's oriented uh, north, south, east, west, and you're so you're running four surveys per per uh, casing. As far as casings go, uh, this the bottom, bottom middle and bottom right picture here are different types of inclinometer casing. Uh, there's there's various manufacturers across the world. They have different uh, connection points between each coupler. There's uh, shear wire. There's quick snap. There's uh, threaded coupling. You know, there it, it's all over the board. And I think there's been heated debates for years on which one's best. You know, but come in different colors, come in different sizes, uh, just depending on, on who you're using or what your preferred method is. But ultimately, it's all the same. Your casing. So now, taking it a step further, we'll get into in-place inclinometers. Same type of measurement, except this instrument sits in the casing uh, permanently or semi-permanently. So basically, the duration of measurement. Uh, these can typically be reused, uh, reconfigured in, in a different project or a different hole. But uh, for all intents and purposes, they're left in the hole for uh, long term measurement or duration of your monitoring program. Uh, they, they typically comprise of a series of interconnected sensors, both uniaxial and biaxial, depending on what you're trying to measure. And they come in different lengths. So, as I mentioned, on a manual sensor, uh, they're taking measurements every two feet, every half meter. These typically come in 0 0.5, 1, 2, 3 meter, and then 2, 5, and 10 foot uh, segments, basically. And you can orient them in any way shape or form. So you could have in a hundred foot hole, let's say you're concerned about 40 to 60 feet below ground surface being your, your area of concern. You could put two foot segments uh, from 40 to 60, or 10 foot segments from zero to 40, 60 to 100, and so on. You can move around however you see fit for your particular application whenever you're trying to understand the field. And these also ride in, inside of the casing. So inside the track casing, they have wheels on them. I'll show some pictures on the next slide. Uh, this middle one's a good diagram here of how they're kind of assembled. And then this diagram on the right is how it would look down. These are various different um, in-place inclinometer types from manufacturers across the world. Uh, EGSI out of, out of the US, SysGeo out of Italy. The middle ones are, are Geocon, it's ours. And uh, on the right here, RST out of Canada. So there's different manufacturers across the world that make these. They're all pretty much the same thing. Um, ultimately, they're, they're measuring the same type of um, shear lateral movement. And on the right here, that's what they would look like physically, um, you know, connected together down hole. 
And so these are typically not manually read, they're typically data logged. So you put them on a standalone data logger or a telemetry system and, and push it out for, for remote viewing or however you're trying to get your data, which we'll get into uh, towards the end of the presentation. And then we'll get into shape arrays. This is also a place phenometer. Uh, these do not require uh, groove casing. They can actually be installed just inside of a PVC pipe, um, down to a one inch PVC pipe, basically. Um, they come, they come pre-assembled, ready to install. Uh, they're made by a company called Measurant out of Canada. And they're used for horizontal and vertical applications, as are IPIs, the shape arrays are, are great for some of this stuff. Um, so they're, they're, they come ready to install to your, your cut length, your cut center spacing, and they can be easily uh, placed in, in, in standard piece of pipe music. This is what some of the results would look like. So typically, when you're running a survey uh, manually with your implementer or with an IPI, you would pull that data and put it into a, a software, like a data reduction software, that will allow you to interpolate what's, what's occurring, where it's occurring. So in these graphs, you can see on the left, that's kind of a, a cumulative displacement relative to your baseline reading graph. So you can see from you know, zero to four feet, you're, you're seeing shear in that direction. Um, and then on the, in the middle here, incremental deviation relative to baseline readings. So you can kind of just see what layer is moving by how much um, over time, how much is it moving, uh, things like that. Very important measurements. And uh, when it comes to safety, these are a, a big measurement a lot of times. So now we'll get into some displacement measurements. Um, again, these are using tailings dams waste piles, open pit mine walls and steps, and then underground mines. So exodensometer is being um, a very accurate way to measure sediment heave uh, in displacement measurement. They are used, uh, again, to measure sediment heave in excavations and embankments, subsidence above mines and tunnels, and oftentimes uh, lay them out and they follow a tunnel board machine to see how see if the ground above the machine is going to be settling or heaving in any way. Uh, movements in rock slides, walls, and abutments. Consolidation of soil under embankments and surcharges. Uh, compression of piles and soil, soil under piles. Spread in embankments and convergence in underground openings such as tunnels. Do you by chance know that last picture, was that just a sinkhole? That was actually, I pulled it off a very good source of Wikipedia, first of all. But <laughs> um, I actually Googled it was a coal mine. I think that collapsed, okay. collapsed underground. And okay. that was basically what was seen on the ground surface um, above that collapse. Okay, thank you. Yep. So to give you a brief kind of uh, animation here, very short of a rod extensometer. So these are used to measure movements of soil and rock along a single axis. So uh, in this particular instance, you have your rock face, your head of the exosometer would be right here. That would be your readout point. Uh, you have a rod that crosses your point of measurement or concern, whether that be settlement or a fissure, and then it's anchored beyond that spherical point of that uh, movement. So as that fissure moves here, fissure opens, the rod and anchor responds to that, and you're gonna see that movement translated at the, at the head of the exosometer. So at the head of the exosometer, um, there's various readout types. Um, you can either manually read them, which is shown on the left here with like a little caliper. Uh, you can use a dial gauge for some instances, vibrating wire transducer. Uh, so you, you can automate them as well. Um, you can use a vibrating wire displacement transducer on top of the head, which can be data log. Um, LBDTs, uh, fiber optics, you know, a bunch of different types of displacement transducers can be used to measure that movement at each of your points. And so there's different types of, of uh, exodensometers depending on your application. Um, we'll go into groundable and mechanical uh, rod exodensometers. There's also wireline exodensometers, um, wide variety of different instruments, but I'll, I'll kind of touch on some of the basics here. Um, so groundable exodensometer, bore holes drilled. You can uh, put certain anchor points down to, to your points of concern. Uh, typically, it would be anywhere from a single point to eight points, eight plus points. Um, we do a lot of custom work where they will go higher than eight points for, for large applications. Um, so for a groundable application, it's typically in a downward oriented installation, uh, usually in soil and weather rock, also hard rock. 
and you want to pick your ground mixture to match your surrounding geology so everything's moving uniformly. That's important to get uh, good readings and make sure the exosometer is not functioning on its own without the surrounding geology. Um, so these come in different rod types and, and anchor types. Um, typically, a stainless steel rod is the most common. We also have a continuous fiberglass rod for uh, shallower installations, like 100 feet less than greater than 100 feet, typically built like a stainless steel. Um, this picture here is a, a standard rebar groundable anchor. And then these are called boros anchors. Uh, they come like this originally, um, unactivated, put them down hole, they're hydraulically activated with a hand pump. Um, and they basically have these little spikes that shoot out. They um, engage with the borehole wall and, and set in the borehole for very soft soil applications, soft soil, soft clay applications. Then we have a mechanical type <clears throat> exosometer. Uh, these would be used a lot in, in rock or concrete. Uh, they're also used a lot for inclined or overhead applications. As you can imagine, trying to grow out um, an exosometer overhead is it, not fun. It's doable, it's been done, but it's not fun. It's very messy, hard to do. Um, so these are basically, you know, you drill a borehole and the anchors are hydraulically or mechanically activated. Uh, for example, this, this copper one here is, is hydraulically activated. You basically put that in the borehole, uh, hydraulically activated, that bladder is gonna blow out and lock into that borehole. Same with the mechanical version down here in the right. Um, a little uh, uh, tools used to basically expand that anchor and lock itself into the borehole. So there's no need to grab them in. This is just a diagram of measuring some convergence in, in underground caverns and tunnels um, with different exosometer orientations. So, you know, here you have exosometers coming off almost every direction, uh, measuring convergence on that tunnel. Here's kind of a, a plan of view of it um, overhead, basically, so it's mostly, mostly mechanical type exosometers. And then we have tape exosometers. Uh, these are also used to measure. Uh, tunnel convergence. So basically, it's, it's a pretty simple instrument. Um, and this diagram has a good picture of it. It's basically you have anchor points in your in your tunnel down the line of your tunnel. Um, a precision, pre precision tape is expanded between using eyelets, basically to hook in the eyelet anchors on the walls of the tunnel. <coughs> the tape exosometer goes on top of that, uh, cranks it down, and then you get a, a measurement. So you come back periodically <laughs> and you can determine uh, convergence in that tunnel at each point. And then we'll get into probe or magnetic exosometers. Um, these are typically installed on a, on a one inch PVC pipe uh, and basically put magnetic anchors around that pipe at areas of concern. Um, they can also be installed on inclinometer casing. So you can have kind of a two in one, you drill one bore hole, <coughs> uh, two, and save some money that way. Uh, oftentimes you put telescopic couplers on there to uh, compensate for any settlement that may occur or heat, actually. Uh, so different measurement points are used. Typically, have a baseline magnet and, and constant strata. Then you put spider magnets, <coughs> points of concern, or even plate magnets at points of concern. And then what we call a read, read switch probe is drop down the um, access pipe. It works almost like a water level meter. So as soon as they hit one of those magnets, it's going to beep. It's an uh, audible LED type measuring tape. You take a measurement <coughs> and you can see what heat or settlement has occurred at each of your points. This is what it would look like. So the top left here is a reed switch probe. These would be spider magnets, um, unactivated and then activated. So they usually go down unactivated. You get to your point of concern or measurement and you can activate the spider magnet. It'll basically expand into your normal wall. Um, it can be folded that way. This is a telescopic coupling, a plate magnet, and then your data ring. Uh, this is how it would look down home. So different spider magnets, you know, your data magnets down here, and so you can lower your uh, research probe and take your measurements down on the access to. And then finally, uh, miniature multipoint exosometers. These are used a ton in mining. Uh, they're basically pre-assembled. They have, uh, they come coiled, like these images here. Uh, so the big manufacturers are, are Yield Point, the MPT out of Canada, uh, which Geocon makes them as well. Um, they're anywhere from one to six anchors and typically grounded in very small diameter boreholes, like 50 millimeter boreholes. 
and then they're used, uh, they're, they're read out electronically using linear potentiometer or any current type induction sensor. These are very low cost, very easy to use. Um, you can put a lot of them out there and get very good data out. Um, So then we'll get into some displacement transducers. Um, some applications will be expansion or contraction of the joints, movement across surface cracks or joints, closure and underground excavations, tunnels, et cetera, displacement associated with landslides and movements of boulders, snow, and, and other objects. Um, again, this is a vibrating wire displacement transducer. This is what the instrument would look like. It's a crack reader. This is usually placed over a crack fault um, fissure and as, a, as that fissure or crack you know expands or contracts that instrument moves um, again the vibrating wire is on fixed tension and then you have it uh, fixed on the other side to a shaft movable shaft as that crack uh, contracts or expands it'll basically uh, register on that wire changing its frequency and you get a measurement. <clears throat> And some field applications of monitoring fissure salts and exfoliation. Uh, these are all crack meters in the field, so they can be in a single plane, they can be oriented two dimensionally, three dimensionally. Um, there's custom applications. This, this one on the right is actually in uh, Yosemite. They're measuring uh, slab changes from winter to summer and temperature effect of the slab. So you get very uh, accurate, accurate measurements for seasonal um, differences there. And they were kind of curious about. Kind of illness was breathing through winter and summer, and they were concerned it was going to potentially fall, so they were monitoring it with a, with a crack meter there. So these are again a variety of displacement transducers. So these can be used on, on top of exosometers as the readout as well. Um, they come in LVDTs, vibrating wire, uh, magnetostrictive, fiber optic, linear potentiometer, dial gauges, different things. And this is uh, for displacement again, long, a long range displacement meter. Um, this is in somewhere in the Caribbean. It was used to measure a landslide. This fence here is actually posted to keep animals from crossing uh, this particular instrument. But what happens is this, this uh, box here has a wild, long wire on a coil. It's expanded down slope to, to the end or point of where they think the landslide may be moving, or it can be on a boulder or on ice. Um, as that slope starts to move, it's going to pull more of that cable out. There's a vibrating wire instrument in that box that records how much cable is being pulled out of that. And you can see how much your slope is moving down, down slope. And then we'll get into stress and stress change in rock. Um, this is often used, these measurements are often used in, in pit slopes, mine pillars, and tailing stands. <clears throat> so we can measure uh, in situ stress measurements in rock. Using low recording techniques, um, where the USBM def uh, deformation gauge, hollow inclusion cell, secret instrument, and door stoppers. Again, it's a measurements of it's a stress measurements in rock. Um, this is showing kind of an overcoring method. Uh, typically, there's a diamond core drilled out, put your deformation gauge in, overcore it, and you can put that core in this device here, and you can get in situ stress measurements um, in point, typically at, at three different axes. And then these are stress changes in rock. These are, these are stress meters. Um, these go in a borehole. These little platens lock into that borehole. So you can kind of have a view looking down the borehole here. Um, again, a vibrating wire instrument has the stress change and the changes in that rock can be felt by that instrument in that wall. And then uh, measuring load. So measuring load of structural members is typically done by uh, using a load cell or by using strain gauges. Um, load cells are can be direct measurement, uh, full bridge with foil gauges, hydraulic type, vibrating wire type, and fiber optic. Um, with strain gauges, it can be indirect measurement, foil gauges, vibrating wire type, or fiber optic. There's a couple other technologies out there as well. <coughs> Some applications for load cells uh, monitoring loads and tiebacks and rock bolts and walls of excavations, monitoring long term loads in concrete dams, monitoring loads in uh, steel arch tunnel supports, and other steel supports. These are a couple of different uh, types of load cells from different manufacturers, again, across the world. Um, hydraulic type from Cisgeo Italy, 
fiber wire type from GeoCon, full bridge type from SysGeo again, and then a fiber optic type from uh, GeoCon China. The different applications for strain gauges, uh, measuring strain and tunnel linings, again, pipelines, and critical and rock bolts. Uh, these are just uh, simple weldable strain gauges. On the left here, these are just a uh, spot weldable strain gauge, very, very small instruments. Um, a lot of times these are pipelines, steel members. On the right here is an arc weldable strain gauge, it's a little longer, like four to six inches. Um, and these are typically arc welded onto steel structures. And then this is an instrument in a rock bolt. So these are used to measure loads in ungrounded rock bolts. Uh, tie backs, tie backs used to stabilize the ground ground excavations, and tie backs <clears throat> using the support of retaining walls. Um, basically, there's a strain gauge put in a section of this rock bolt, and uh, where that rock bolt is installed, you know, the part that's initiated in the rock is where the strain gauge would go, and uh, we can instrument those and get strain ratings on those rock bolts. And then finally, we'll get into some temperature measurements. Um, some applications are, are measuring temperature on the surface or at depth in boreholes, leach pads, waste rock, dam embankments, or in the laboratory. And there's a lot of different ways to measure, to measure temperature. Uh, we focus on thermistors in particular. Um, they're miniature and expensive, uh, very wide range, uh, negative 100, uh, 100 degrees C to almost 500 degrees C, very hot environments, um, very good sensitivity. It can also be a vibrating wire type temperature sensor. Uh, they're manufactured in, in different orientations and strings. Um, for example, PVC, stainless steel, again, Inconel, titanium, depending on the application. Uh, cable type, again, is taken into consideration uh, depending on temperature fluctuation on the site. And then we can do uh, very long strings of these as well. So up to like 250 points plus, uh, you can get very long temperature profiles and boreholes or uh, in waste rock or where you're installing it to. This is an image from the extreme of America. Uh, they do, they, they kind of specialize in thermistor strings. Um, this is a very long thermistor string as well here. So that's kind of a, a brief overview of, of some of the instruments that exist out there and, and what they're used to measure. Uh, now we'll get briefly into, into data collection, types of data collection, and then we'll hopefully kind of put the whole thing together for you. So some types of data collection, I like to break it down into four different, different parts. Um, you have your manual measurements, your handheld readouts, you are physically going there, taking a the measurement and recording it. Um, we have standalone data loggers where the instruments are gonna be wired in, uh, pre-programmed, come back periodically and download. We have wireless data collection where uh, you know, an entire monitoring program can be uh, collected and pushed to a single point where you can control the full network, download the full network to a single point, and then finally push it out to a cloud-based system or uh, third-party software, things like that. So again, manual measurements typically perform with handheld readouts. They can even be performed you know, physically with a, a dial gauge or a caliper. You know, it's a physical measurement. You're going there, you're recording a single data point, writing it down, putting it in the program. It's probably the most basic form of measurement. Um, these are typically performed on uh, zero reading or you're zeroing out a gauge, kind of when you're taking a preliminary measurement to base all of your future measurements on. Uh, typically, a uh, manual measurement of handheld readout is kind of your first step. So the next step being uh, wired standalone data loggers. <clears throat> Again, there's pictures of, of various manufacturers of, of standalone data loggers. Um, these are for the, the instrument. It's directly wired into a data logger. Uh, field staff would connect to these data loggers with software or uh, a computer program. You can basically set your measurement parameters as far as frequency. Uh, can you put in calibration information, um, you know, serial numbers, install information, and then you can come back periodically and download your data, whether that be daily or weekly, quarterly, depending on your monitoring program. Um, you sit out there, they collect your data, come back and grab your data. And then taking it a step further, uh, we'll get into wireless data collection and telemetry. So, Again, different systems around the world that, that perform this operation. Um, think of it like a standalone data logger, but now we're putting you know, radio communication or cell communication, uh, Wi-Fi communication. Basically, it's taking all of that data from those standalone data loggers and pushing it either to a central point where you can uh, manipulate your measurement 
frequency of, of all the sensors in your in your uh, program, or you can download your whole program from one point. Um, it kind of makes things a lot easier that way. Um, presently, most of these are communicating via radio, so you would set up what we call nodes. Um, basically, that collect the data from the sensors, shoot it off your radio to a central gateway or supervisor or a hub, and you can either download from that hub or that hub will shoot it off um, via cellular or Wi-Fi to a, a cloud base or a database somewhere. And then finally, taking it a step further than that, uh, once that data is sent off to a cloud or a database, uh, there's a lot of third-party software companies that exist, particularly in the mining industry, um, that basically will collect all of your data or you input all of your data into, and you can get you know, report quality graphics. You can generate very detailed reports. You can look at time series. You can set alarms, you know, high, low alarms, threshold alarms. You can have things such as uh, SMS, email, you know, text messages, even audio visual alarms, uh, you know, slow stuff to fail, siren goes off. Uh, all this stuff can be input into software and then help to aid in the field, you know, where, where your slope might fail, or your water level is too high, or uh, whatever parameter, you know, may have super, uh, superseded your, your original thought. Some of these companies are Canary Systems, Sensometrics, Vista Data Vision, and Eagle I.O. And so some of these pictures you can kind of see, like this is a picture of sense metrics. You can see an open pit mine. You know, you may have your various instruments displayed in that open pit. You can click each one, see a time series, you know, see when they're installed, what kind of data you're getting, look at time series between different instruments. Um, it's really powerful tools to look at all of your uh, instruments in the field and really you know, get something useful out of your data. And then briefly touching uh, finally on remote sensing. I'll just go over this briefly. This is kind of out of my wheelhouse, to be honest, but um, some, some uh, technologies out there are satellite star interferometry, terrestrial interferometry, laser scanning, infrared thermography, and digital image correlation. Hard to say. So satellite star interferometry, uh, they're basically radar Im images collected by satellites in the <coughs> area over, over time. So we take the same shot over time, and then it's possible to measure millimeter displacements of ground and structures over time. So you can see a slope moving or a structure moving in very small interference using this technology. And then terrestrial interferometry allows monitoring of displacements of structures and natural elements, such as landslides, rock slopes, volcanoes, uh, with sub millimeter accuracies. Laser scanning this allows for 3D high resolution uh, digital models to be collected as well as structures, infrastructure, slopes, landslides, open pits. <coughs> infrared thermography uh, assesses superficial temperatures through infrared radiation intensity emitted by the objects in field of view. Uh, the results are far, false color digital images where color depends on the intensity of radiation each point. And finally, digital image correlation. Uh, these allow for measurement of, measurements of surface deformation and displacements through the correlation of co-registered photograms collected at different time intervals by a high-resolution digital camera. So I'm going to put all of this together. So we have our remote sensing. We have our instruments in the field. Um, you know, for example, this is an open pit. We have instruments all around, exosometers, piezos, inclinometers all being shot out to a cloud system or a third party system. Tailings dam, same thing, the decoration from tailings dam and being collected and pushed out to a program or collected in some monitoring program. In the underground, again, same thing, different instruments, different parameters being collected. And then on top of that, we can overlay all of our remote sensing. So let's say you see something in the field, um, you know, maybe your remote sensing is showing some slope failure up here. You know, you can go and, and look at your piezos, you can look at your axisometer, look at your uh, inclinometer, and see how those are reacting. If you have uh, very high water pressure in that area, the piezos are showing it, translates perfectly to your uh, satellite imagery, and it's, it's a cause and effect correlation between what we see uh, instrument wise and what we see as a, as a big order view as far as remote sensing. So, you know, all, using all these instruments, it, it basically helps give you, you know, the knowledge and, and data to back it up. For, uh, to improve safety, to improve um, you know the mining, the mining uh, operation itself. So a lot can be done with this kind of stuff. 
that's about all I have for you today. So I'll open it up to questions or discussion. Uh, more than happy to answer any questions. You can reach me on email if you have to run. Uh, more than happy to, to, to email you back and we can have a separate conversation. Um, yeah, really appreciate your time and thanks for having me. Um, if you could, a lot of people just use chat on there anyway, so. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Does anyone have any? Mm -hmm. So, uh, all the instruments you were talking about that, for example, the final meter, extension meters, the displacement, the temperatures, uh, and you're also talking about the handheld measurement, the, ins the stationary and the, the, and the, and the cloud that wireless. Yeah. So, based on the technology so far, is it possible so they can match with each other? So is there any limitation that, for example, like probably this kind of instrument can only found with handheld or stationary? Yeah, to an extent. So like any vibrating wire instrument can be, it really depends on the technology of the instrument itself. So any vibrating wire instrument can be read manually. It can be data logged very easily, can be transmitted, um, you know, via telemetry. Um, there's other instruments that, you know, like a tape exosometer is going to only be a manual measurement. Um, and a manual inclinometer with a, with a reel and probe is only going to be a manual measurement. You can input that into a software later on, but that's really just going to be an on-site measurement. Whereas like an in-place inclinometer, it can be measured. So it all, all depends on your on the requirement and your yeah. so, so if I only have a limited budget, then I can just put handheld. And <coughs> if I want it remotely and cloud-based, <coughs> Basically, you mean that if the uh, if the uh, budget is enough, that technically all the instrument can be the wireless, wireless and cloud. Yeah, it's really just how far you want to take it. So, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I get the opportunity to visit a lot of mines across the U.S., and you know, some of them are just taking. You know, maybe they have five or six pesos out there. It might not be a very big operation. That's all they need. I'm sorry, I'm using short slang here, but um, they may be just taking periodic <coughs> monthly measurements or something and writing them down. I mean, as simple as putting them in an Excel sheet. Um, other mines, you know, big operations like uh, Kennecott or some of these big, you know, big copper mines, big gold mines, they're going to have things beyond what I even shared. You know, they're going to have full control rooms with big screen TVs, you know, updated every four seconds with radar and laser, and then they're correlating all their instruments into that as well. Um, it really just depends on the operation, the size of the operation, and kind of what their needs are. So to, I guess to answer your question, they can be as simple as a manual measurement, or it can be as complicated as, you know, every minute or every second. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's kind of, so I guess I, I, can I just bound together a pair that, oh, I, I need this, wireless, I need this, handheld. Yeah, yeah just absolutely. It really just depends on customizing yeah. matching. Exactly. It really just depends on your needs and, and what you're looking to obtain. I kind of want to segue off that question. Yep. So you listed competitors to GeoCon as well. Absolutely. Mine life can be huge. So as they expand to new areas, are they stuck with a single provider as far as um, merging uh, the system into one control room? How does it work if they're using competitors or at different times they just order different equipment? No, absolutely. And, and that's probably the most common case in most mine sites are probably a mix of different instruments. And, you know, there's instruments we don't touch, you know, so you might have a different vibration monitor or, you know, they're all tied into a common system. Um, for the most part, you can use a variety of instruments and, you know, there's a lot of third party data loggers and, and software that can accept all these different types of instruments. So, for example, like Campbell, are you guys familiar with Campbell Scientific? You know, they're a, they're a big data logger company. Um, they probably make the most high tech data loggers in the world. You know, they have data loggers that can accept vibrating wire input directly. They can have analog frequencies can put it directly. So things like uh, string gauges, and any 420 MA output basically. Um, and then also RS-485 addressable inputs, which are gonna be your like in-place inclinometers, which are an addressable MEMS chip, uh, basically going down the line. So um, yes, they basically all, all different types of instruments are tied in together, various manufacturers, various technologies, various types. It can be complicated to do so, but it's doable. Okay, thank you. And you're not stuck with one, with one person. So people switch around all the time or they, 
have a preference, maybe somebody quits, they like somebody else, you know, things turn over all the time. So these are long operations, you know. Yep. So I'm assuming that in a, for example, in a working mine, when you actually purchase the, uh, the actual like extensometers and chronometers, those actually then belong to the company. They're not like leased out from your company. So there's never a situation where you guys are like, oh, you're changing who's doing your data collection. Okay, well, now we're going to go pull out stuff that we have and let someone else put it in. Um, that rarely occurs. It may be more of like a, as soon as this instrument dies, we'll, uh, yeah, okay. if, if and when it dies, we'll replace it. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of just as it goes, you know. Yeah, that's kind of vague. I'm sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> they're not on lease though. People they're not on lease. So I'm sorry. So uh, yeah. I forgot that part. I'm sorry. So typically, most of the instruments are almost one use. So like a piezometer or an exensometer is typically going to be grouted in. So it's, it's kind okay, of a permanent, yeah. it's a permanent install to an extent. So let's say that instrument dies in, or a piezometer is grouted in, you're measuring pore pressure in your open bit. Um, let's say that instrument dies, maybe they're blasting an area, cuts the cable. Um, rather than going and retrieving that instrument, you're probably going to drill a new borehole right next to it and put a new instrument. Okay. Um, for the most part, most of these instruments are owned by whoever purchases them. There are certain applications where things may be rented or leased, such as like a load cell can be rented quite often. Uh, vibration monitors can be rented quite often, which we didn't really touch on, but are used. Um, inclinometers are rented, portable inclinometers okay. are rented, typically not in-place inclinometers. Uh, in-place inclinometers are usually very custom to what you're trying to measure as far as segment-wise and length. Um, but probe inclinometers are often rented. Um, for most mining applications, at least in my experience, um, they're doing this stuff so frequently, they'll typically purchase. And in the scheme of things, this stuff's like, you know, uh, a smidgen of their budget. <laughs> okay. Um, is your system connected to warning systems? To boring systems? No, warning. Warning systems. They can be. So we personally, so we produce data loggers um, for our instruments. They're, they're somewhat basic. You know, they're more of a standalone type option. Uh, we do have a full telemetry system that will push it out to a cloud, but we stop there pretty much. So to, uh, to back, I can back up to the slides, but there's a lot of third party software companies out there that do just that. Uh, Sense Metrics, Google I.O., Vista Data Vision, uh, Canary Systems is a, is a really big one in mining. All of those systems will basically take that information either from our data loggers or any other manufacturer's data loggers, Campbell Scientific, um, and put them in their, their software. And their software will be the one kind of generating these warnings or uh, you know, alarms or text message warnings, email warnings, visual warnings. So all of that can be accomplished and it's done quite often. You work with them to integrate. With yes, them. very often. Thank you. Yep. So first question, how do the different instrumentation systems compare in terms of operational status? Basically, which instruments may require more maintenance or reinstallation? Um, it's gonna depend really on the instrument and the environment in which it's installed. So for example, if you're installing a piezometer in a leach pad, it may be very low pH, very high pH, um, gross environment, may have not as much longevity as you would just installed in the sandstone. In the, in the um, it really just depends on the application. All of these instruments are designed to be, uh, for the most part, long-term operational. Um, and the different technologies are gonna vary. Vibrating wire in particular is made to be very robust and last a very long time, um, but things happen, you know, especially in, in the mining industry. I mean, I can't tell you how many trucks or tractors, you know, run over a cable and sever the cable, or, you know, blasting may occur and you, you blast out half your bazometers. Um, it just happens. Things are always, you know, reinstalled based on the needs of, of whatever data is being collected. Um, so I hope that answers the question. So more maintenance and reinstallation. Uh, I guess at some point on an exit sometimeter, you may be replacing your displacement transducers on the top of the anchor points that could come up. Um, in an inclinometer, I guess there's instances where a sensor may die and you can replace a certain sensor in the line of the inclinometer. Um, but for the most part, these things are, are very durable, uh, less outside factors. So outside factors can definitely have an effect on these instruments um, and, and it varies site to site. Is that the only one? Is that the only one of there? Yeah. Okay, cool. 
So, for example, you know, you, pro you provide the sensors and you install them, right? We don't install them. Um, so that would typically be installed by any consultant or contractor or mine staff or drill a driller to the point often. Okay, so if they are like installed very well, yep. And then somehow they are like the sensor itself that is not working like properly. Mm -hmm. Then let's say some landslide happened, and the reason why we couldn't like predict that is because of the sensor. So do you take the responsibility for that? Typically, no. So the responsibility would typically be on the monitoring program. Um, and you, you would want to have enough redundancy in case that was to happen. So you need to basically under our sensors measure parameters. It's your job as the engineer or you know, mining staff or consultant to basically understand what kind of data needs to be collected and how it needs to be collected. And you know, if there, what redundancy may need to be put in there to make sure you have a good picture of what's occurring. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to end it there. I actually have some questions, but if you can stick around after. Absolutely. I'll, I'll be around after. I have nowhere to go. Um, if anyone has to run it, give me my card as well. If not, this is my email. Feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to discuss any of this with you. If I can't answer it, I'll point you in the right direction. Thank you very much for coming today. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Nolan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone as we um, end the talk that it will be available on YouTube. If I can figure out how to stop screen sharing. Do I stop screen sharing? There we go. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Um, other, as far as seminar housekeeping, we are looking for new volunteers for next year's seminar. So if you would like to do my job, it's a lot of fun. Um, please let me, Fati, or Alejo know. Um, and thanks again. I'm going to close the talk now.